in the um, earlier session, a question came up uh, when Matthew was talking about all the things that are happening here from, or all of the things that the um, uh, Edmund Hillary Foundation are supporting and referencing the, the social entrepreneurs and nonprofit people in this room. And, and the question kind of came up, well, what is this stuff? I mean, all this stuff sounds nice, you know, restorative justice, regenerative agriculture, impact investing, social enterprise, uh, ecological healing, et cetera, et cetera. It all sounds quite nice, but what do these things all have to do to e with each other, except that they're all kind of like in the category of a good thing? Uh, so I'd like to actually speak to that a little bit what unifies all of these areas of activism and, and why is it that when you, even if you are passionate about composting toilets, why is it when you meet somebody whose passion is uh, reforming the prisons or, or saving the whales, why is it that you recognize immediately that this person is an ally? And the way I look at it, is that we are all serving the same thing. The emergence of what I call a new and ancient story. And that we are all part of a transition from the old story, the story of separation, into a new story, which is also an ancient story, the story of interbeing. So, whereas separation understands it's, it's our mythology, our meaning the dominant culture. It understands life and self and the world in a certain way as understanding us as, as separate individuals in a world of other, as these, as these kind of bubbles of psychology bouncing around in an alien universe of generic particles and deterministic forces that must be overcome in order to have a good life well-being in that old story comes through the domination and control of the other. The competing other beings out there or the random forces of nature. So the old story looks at human civilization as this kind of triumphalist progression from a state of primitive superstition to a state of scientific knowledge and technological power over reality. And that story says but says it not very convincingly anymore, not compared to 50 years ago, says that someday our triumph will be complete and we will not even need nature anymore because we will have devised technological substitutes thanks to the miracle of whatever uh, the steam engine or, well, that didn't quite work, so maybe it was electricity. And while that didn't quite bring about paradise either, so maybe it's you know nanotechnology or genetic engineering that's gonna be the final frontier. New Frontiers is about a very different kind of frontier that recognizes the limitations and even the futility of this story that's bringing us not to paradise, but as Matthew mentioned in some of those slides, bringing us to, to helplessness, bringing us to the decay, the, the, the degeneration of the ecological basis of life on Earth bringing us to a place of, wow, maybe we didn't understand how to do all of this. Maybe we don't know. Sending us, therefore, into a space between stories, as I like to call it, where that story of separation doesn't work anymore. Where we see that it's brought about crisis that cannot be solved from that story. Could be on a personal level where the story of how to be human, how to have a life, how to have a marriage, how to take care of your health, how to uh, engage the world of work. You had a formula to do that. You followed it maybe very dutifully. You went to the doctor for your annual checkup and then you got sick and the arsenal of modern medicine couldn't help you. And perhaps that was your initiatory experience into a new story where, well, first a space between stories where you're like, I don't know what to do, and then you start in that empty space, then a new story can emerge. So everyone enters this in a different way, and our civilization as a whole is also entering a space between stories. And one thing I appreciate about, about New Frontiers is that it's not an attempt to push the existing frontier a little farther, 
one thing that, you know, like these Silicon Valley guys, like I kind of know the typical Silicon Valley mindset. It's, it's another version of masters of the universe. We know how to do this. We can do anything, anywhere, because we have the technology, we have the know-how. But the founders of this project are coming to it with um, an understanding of the limitations of that way of approaching the world, and therefore a kind of humility that recognizes we don't know and we're willing to learn. Another thing that Matthew mentioned that um, I feel is a very important aspect of this transition, the, in the, his answer to the last question, he said that it all comes from an understanding that life itself is a gift, which is different from the story of separation's attitude toward the world and nature as something that we extract from with force. But other cultures really understood that the world and our lives are a gift, that we didn't earn, we didn't earn this planet. It wasn't through our hard efforts that we created water. We didn't earn the sun. We didn't earn our breath. We didn't earn our mothers taking care of us. Recognizing that brings about gratitude, because if you know that you've been so richly gifted, then you feel grateful. Gratitude being the desire to give in turn. And that leads to a view of life, not as a headlong competition to maximize self-interest, but as a journey of the gift to discover what is it that I'm here to do? How am I a gift to the world? How can I give forward from this rich gift that I've received? And that is what unites so much of what the people in this room are doing in whatever social enterprise or nonprofit or it might be just very humble work with your hands. That unites what we're all doing. I mean, maybe you're a healer, maybe you're a farmer, maybe you're working with composting toilets. But all of these things are based on the spirit of the gift because you're not asking, how can I take the most? You're asking, what is the best way that I can enrich regenerate and heal the world around me. Because in a new story, see, in, 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 a new, in the story of, of, of interbeing, using Thich Nhat Hanh's word for it, in the story of interbeing, that's not an act of self-sacrifice because we understand that we're not actually separate individuals in a world of other, but that we are the holographic mirror of all that is that anything that happens in the world is happening to us, that anything we do, we ultimately do to ourselves, that the consequences of what we do are inescapable, that no wall or fortress or security fence or surveillance system or attack drone system can keep out what is happening to all beings in this world. Therefore, your well-being depends on the well-being of all. So your service to the other is also a service to self. The division between the heart and the mind disappears in the logic of interbeing. And that is one of the aspects of the reunion that we are approaching. So that might be a bit theoretical. I don't know. Um, I know a lot of people here are very hands-on. Um, but I wanted to give this kind of uh, big scale picture to, to what's going on here, why we feel so united. One thing that I was, so okay, I want to also relate this a little bit to um, the ceremony that we experienced this morning, which I, I deeply appreciated because sometimes at these things, like a lot of times now, it's become fashionable to begin your conference or something like that with, uh, you know, you trot in, a, in, the, in the North America, you trot in a few Native Americans and they do some invocation of the four elements, thank you very much, and then they get sent out and it just reeks of tokenism. But this felt, um, it felt sincere. And I felt, like I felt really welcomed. And after, um, during the, the short break after that, I heard 
um, uh, Ditti, hope I try and pronounce that right, Ditti talk about, um, he was speaking very passionately about the um, importance of learning the Maori language. And the mind of separation says, well, why is that really so important? You know, I mean, given all that's happening on this planet, given climate change, given that, that we might not even survive the next 20 years, if you believe some of the more alarmist uh, scientists, isn't it kind of a waste of time to devote? I had this conversation with a, with a leading environmentalist in the States. He's like, Charles, someday you're going to have to decide if you're going to be relevant. Because I've been talking to him about my passions, about some of the things I'm interested in. Yeah, I'm interested in, in climate change, and I'm also interested in restoring the sacred aspect of the masculine. And I'm also interested in restorative justice and restorative circles. And I'm also interested in um, various kinds of holistic medicine and the intelligence of water and plant communication and pan-subjective pan metaphysics, you know, and all these other things. And like, and he's like, you know, that's all very nice, but come on. None of that is going to matter when the sea levels rise 30 meters. None of that's going to matter when the temperature rises 10 degrees. Like, you got to put that off and deal with what's important here. It's a call to, a call to arms, a call to, to, to here is the enemy right now. And I tried to communicate to him that that mentality is actually part of the problem. That the habit of the, the problem-solving strategy of first find an enemy and then go to war against that enemy is the same psychic energy as the war against nature, the treating of all of the world as an enemy or a competitor. And that the solutions that come from that contribute to the ground conditions that give rise to the problem to begin with. That climate change or global warming is kind of a symptomatic fever of something else. In my research into climate change, I've discovered that we have underemphasized the importance of local ecosystems to maintain global equilibrium. And that, and instead put all of the emphasis and identified green as being related to carbon, made that the enemy and invoked kind of a war mentality against that enemy that lends itself to global solutions and empowers global institutions. But in fact, the capacity of, of intact, healthy ecosystems to absorb carbon, even, even if you do want to look at it in the car, through the carbon lens, even that way, the capacity of intact ecosystems to absorb carbon is much greater than anyone had imagined. And that if we had a if we had planet-wide healthy forests, healthy mangrove swamps, healthy seagrass, healthy um, peat bogs, like all of these ecosystems, we could handle a lot of emissions without a problem. But instead, these are being degraded everywhere, which means that even if we cut carbon emissions to zero, the planet would still die because it would be like, like you're degrading all of your tissues and organs all the time and, and suffering fevers. And someone says, well, the room is too warm. Let's turn down the temperature in the room. That's the problem. But the problem is much deeper than that. And it is unavoidably local because there is no blanket recipe for how to take care of your local places, the land that you live on. That knowledge is fundamentally local. And it requires um, a, a political shift and a conceptual shift that re-empowers the local, which takes me back to the Maori language. Because language is more than just a, a, an arbitrary system of representational signs that could be replaced with some other arbitrary system of, of representational signs. Language is intimately related to the land itself. And the way, and this is what I was getting when I heard the, um, the, the speakers doing the welcoming uh, dialogue at the beginning, I'm like, 
there is power encoded in these words, encoded in even the, the prosody, the cadence of these sounds that is necessary for the thriving and the survival of our, of our, of our world. In part, language, because language ultimately, where does it come from? It comes from the land itself, which is why even a language that has gone extinct can come back if people have a close enough relationship to the land. And you see when people migrate to a new place, their language changes. New Zealand has its own special accent. If that were left undisturbed, if we cut off all global communication that maintains homogeneity around the world, then New Zealand English would gradually migrate over centuries to something that it wouldn't be exactly like Maori was because the land evolves too. But you would recognize it as of this place. So this means that restoring, regenerating, and celebrating and spreading the Maori language is an essential part of caring for the land, the place of New Zealand, which is the work that's necessary in order to do New Zealand's part in healing this planet. And also, if it can be done successfully here, it serves as kind of a template or an example or a precedent for other places to, to do that. Everywhere I go, I ask myself, uh, and this is the question I did in that little dialogue, um, what is the unique gift of this place to the world? Every culture has, uh, every nation, every country, every place has a unique gift to give toward the healing and the evolution of the whole. And every place I go, I'm always curious, what is that gift? of that country, just as you might ask yourself, what is my gift? What is the gift of this country? So, and I'm not, I don't wanna be presumptuous because I've only been here for a week, but I'm, I, feel, I felt like I was starting to get a sense of it. Um, New Zealand is very fortunate to have the indigenous language still pretty strong. You know, it's still a living language. People still think in that language even. So it, it can be restored a lot more easily than some of the extinct languages of North America. And that language encodes knowledge that you might not be able to, to quantify or explicitly write down, but it induces a mindset, it induces a state of being that, that in which someone intuitively knows how to live in harmony and mutual benefit with the land here. So I was really heartened to hear, um, we went to a, um, another ceremony a couple days ago at, where there were some government officials and they, one of them was talking about bringing the Maori language into the schools and making it a mandatory subject for, for all school children in New Zealand. I'm like, wow, that's kind of, that's like reverse colonialism, you know, because it wasn't that long ago where, where I mean, this happened all over the world where speaking the indigenous language was was discouraged or punished even in schools. I'm not sure if that happened here where like kids would get hit if they spoke an indigenous language like that. And now it's getting reversed. And I think part of that reversal, you know, like maybe there's some ele elements of tokenism or, okay, let's respect other cultures because that's a good idea. But there's also, I think, an element of humility coming in here because as our story breaks down, the dominant story, the story of separation, and we realize we don't know how to do this anymore. Our tools are making things worse and worse. Help. We become more open to the stories that are carried by other people. So the reason that, and this is happening in America, it's happening many places, the reason that people are now drawn to indigenous knowing, indigenous ways of life, indigenous knowledge, indigenous language. It's not actually and should not be out of guilt or playing the victimology game. It's because we recognize that there's something that we really need to know on behalf of the planet and that this knowledge is still preserved 
especially in New Zealand, where there's something like 15%, um, someone told me that, 15% Maori. Like, that's, that's enough for New Zealand to be kind of a um, precedent setter. And this is something that has not yet happened on Earth. The turn of an entire modern nation state to say, yeah, let's really incorporate the um, suppressed and marginalized indigenous thread of our society. And another inspiring thing uh, is that the Maori also, like, this is part of the gift of New Zealand too, like um, there's such a welcoming, inclusive attitude that is hospitable to this um, emerging humility. So that's kind of what I'm getting about New Zealand, um, that the unique gift of New Zealand has something to do with the healing of the colonial rift. And that's something that really inspires me about, about New Frontiers too, that it hasn't, um, that it's not like just giving lip service to this, but that there's a real effort um, and um, humility in, in seeking this unification. Yeah, I would just maybe suggest that as you um, spend the next four days here, hmm, that you, that you explore and cultivate this feeling of alliance and maybe kind of test drive. I didn't say too much about the story of interbeing, but that is, I believe, what unifies us. And so to kind of take that on and, and, and see how does that help you make sense of what you're doing, what you're drawn to, and what draws the other people here together. What is, because, I'll just say one more thing, if that's okay. The world is built on a story. Money is a story. Law is a story. Politics, that's a story. When the story changes, the world changes. The dominant story is in crisis, consequently, Everything built upon that story is falling apart. And we have the chance to step into service to another story. That's why we're here, actually. Because out in society, you're going to be called crazy, naive, irresponsible, impractical if you follow that story in your life. Because no one else is doing it. Well, not no one else, but it's kind of a new thing. It's really important to come together in a place where everyone around you says, yeah, I'm following that too. I mean, I spent you know, so many decades on this lonely journey, and I think many of you might have experienced this as well, this loneliness, this self-doubt. Is it really okay to live my life this way? and maybe even getting pulled down, as if like you come up for air and you have this, this um, epiphany or this experience that says, yeah, this is how life is supposed to be. This is how the world could be. You're shown an experience of deep connection or intimacy or cooperation, and, and you recognize it as real. You recognize it as a promise of what's possible. But then, the routines of modern life, the financial pressures of modern life, and your own internalized habits pull you back under the waves. And you almost forget what it was like above, and then you claw your way up again. And yes, here I am back in reality, and then you get pulled down again. And, the, and maybe you went through years or decades of that like I did. But now what's changing is you come up for air, and there's somebody else there too on the surface. And you hold each other up before you both get sucked down. But then you come up again and there's four people or eight or 10. And now we're creating a living mat 
in the new story, holding each other in that new story, because this isn't something that one enlightened guy comes and does and leads everybody else to it. This is a process of group awakening, of collective awakening, where we all hold each other in this new story because this consciousness that has been cultivated for so many centuries is now rising to the surface and bringing us up with it. And so we can hold each other in this space. And that's why it's so important to come together sometimes and, and abide in a story of interbeing for a few days so that that experience imprints itself on us and creates the ties and the networks. And that's why it's so important to meet some of these new people and, and with the curiosity of how are you my ally and what is your gift so that that the uh, flotation mat <laughs> that we're creating together isn't just limited to this place. So there's an internal imprint where we, where we really immerse ourselves in this new and ancient way of perceiving. And then there's the external imprint through the relationships that we cultivate here and carry forth into alliances after the event. Yeah, so thank you very much. <laughs>